Um, before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to their elders, past and present. So today we are really excited to have brought together an expert panel that Chris Barr, our co-founder, will shortly introduce. But firstly, a bit of background on why we're here and why we've chosen to bring together what really is quite a select group and a diverse group to come together in person, which is, which is still quite novel in this environment. Here at Sonda, we're, we're fortunate to have the opportunity to work with leading organisations reshaping employee care around the country. But there's something unique about what each of you are here today doing and how you've managed to adapt your own workforces over the past two years in particular. We know that employers are expected to do more than ever for their employees, and we know that the lines between personal and, and, and professional lives are frankly blurred in a way we haven't ever seen. But what we also know is that a lot of the formal programs for well workplace wellbeing still actually aren't getting the take up. So today's forum is really about you sharing insights, what's worrying you, how are you adapting to the challenges and improving your workplace wellbeing. We'll kick off with, with some targeted insights from the panel, but really keen to sort of open that up, share in a, in a really trusted group. Uh, it won't be live streamed, again, novel, but, but it will be recorded, um, but, but really encourage you to share, network amongst industry peers, and appreciate you taking the time to join us. And with that, I'll, I'll pass over to Chris Maher, our co-founder, to, to kick off the discussion. Thank you, Amy. Um, and again, thanks to everyone for, for joining us here today. We're joined by an extraordinary group of people who we're really, we're really proud to sit alongside today. Uh, firstly, Sarah Derry. Sarah, um, Sarah is the Senior Vice President of uh, Talent and Culture at Accor Group, the, the hotel group, and of course, um, recently was awarded HR Director of the Year, which in, in this uh, company, of course, um, speaks to particular relevance and, and, and has led to a particular... <laughs> that was actually the cue for me to say that HR Director thing, and I'm a little bit in front of you. But, but nonetheless, but, um, but obviously alongside a terrific team at Accor, Sarah has led to a tumultuous period uh, which has been impacted very, very heavily in the tourism and hospitality sector. Um, Sarah, we're really looking forward to your insights, of course. Uh, Alexia Houston from Clayton Nutz uh, is the head of uh, insurance and risk. Um, and we're looking forward to understanding how that title particularly pertains to how you lead wellbeing frameworks within the context of professional services, of course, Alexia. Um, high performance organisation uh, is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, law firms, of course, is a sub subset of the professional services industry writ large. My uh, other co-founder alongside Pete Bernheim, who's behind Craig Cowdery, is actually alumni from uh, Clayton Woods, and he asked me to call it a bastion of high performance. <laughs> um, so, so we're looking forward to, to understanding that, that Alexia. Um, we've got uh, Simone Sh uh, Shug uh, from Nearmap, the Chief People Officer of Nearmap, which is an ASX technology company that's really revolutionising the way we use mapping to support a whole bunch of different and really insightful and, and, and important projects. I think without stealing your thunder, of course, Simone, understand that just today or perhaps this week, um, the revenues from the United States business have exceeded that in Australia. So it's a really exciting time leading an organisation across multiple geographies. Really excited to hear how you're contending with those things. Um, and of course, uh, Brian Long um, from Woolworths Group. Uh, Brian is the general manager of safety, health and wellbeing. I think it's interesting when you, you think about these people leaders that we've got alongside, all with different titles, but all sort of looking at the wellbeing frameworks within their organisations from a unique perspective. Um, Brian, of course, um, sitting on the forefront of managing a, a hugely complex supply chain during one of the most significant challenges that we faced in modern history and being at the coalface of feeding the nation, keeping our bottoms very clean with, with toilet paper <laughs> uh, and, and all the rest. But, but on a serious note, a, a huge challenge um, largely because so much of the organisation is front facing but it, it extends into the far reaches of the Australian uh, population and Brian we're really looking forward to your insights. Um, but I thought we might get started with a, with a little story as is typical for me. Um, some, some months ago I, I guess Sarah to start with you 
Um, I, I, I reached out after having been connected to, to Simon, your, your CEO, Simon McGrath, um, and he said, well, you need to speak to Sarah. This is, uh, this is really a matter for Sarah. And Sarah wouldn't take a meeting with me until <laughs> I had read this masterpiece called Hardest. And, and what Accor has done, and, and I'm pleased to say that Sarah is one of the architects here of this terrific wellbeing philosophy, Hardest. And, it's a, it's a philosophy about well-being, which we're going to hear from you about, please, Sarah. Um, but importantly, it's got two front covers. One cover speaks to Hartis as it applies to the internal culture of the organisation. And, and the other cover sort of invites you to look at it from a customer's perspective. Um, hugely complex landscape that you've dealt with over the past few months, particularly Sarah and your team. You know, largely casual workforce, hugely diverse backgrounds. Can you tell us about well-being, what it means for you, what it means for Hartist? Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe if I start a little bit with Hartist. Hartist is a combination of two words, heart and artist, and you put them together and you get Hartist, which is now trademarked to a core. Um, and it's a principle, or it's a philosophy really about human connection and the importance of that on a, a really deep level. It's um, based in science as well. So there's um, scientific journals that are referenced, case studies that are referenced and so on. Um, and it's, so it's deeply, it's not just a philosophy of how, making you feel good, it's actually understanding everything, you know, like around oxytocin and, um, you know, how human kindness and generosity and, and the studies that are linked to that and how that makes people, um, you know, the psychological safety grows and um, things like that. So um, there are four principles of Hardest, and I, I won't probably talk to all four of them, but um, one of them is that every person has a story. Um, and another is people crave belonging. And another is that, um, that, uh, that you know, people hate to be wrong. So um, there are, there's some of the things that we think about. And it's really about being your true authentic self and bringing that to work. And when you do that, you know, when you bring your whole person to work, then it fulfills you on a personal and professional level. So um, I often say when I, I think about what's happened to our industry, you know, hospitality, travel and tourism for the last two years, if you didn't have a strong culture going into it, Chris, you certainly, you know, would, you would have been very difficult to survive and you couldn't create one in the middle of all that. Um, if I go back to last year, just to sort of set the scene a little bit, so we'd had hardest, we had an incredibly strong culture around that. Um, it was deeply about well-being, diversity, inclusion, all of those really important elements. Um, but we um, had about 21,000 employees across the Pacific, the area I'm responsible for, and by April that was reduced down to about 7,000. So, and if you imagine the time frame, we're talking really a four week period. So that was things like letting every single casual go. Um, people who'd worked with us for less than six months just terminated. I mean, there were shocking decisions for the survival of our company. And when that happened, um, and our industry really, when that happened, we really had to face into, you know, how are we going to, to look after people and care for them through this? Because um, even though we did let casuals go and people on contracts and, and all those sorts of things, we wanted to keep looking after them. We were incredibly blessed with a couple of things. Our global company, um, the shareholders gave um, part of their dividend from the prior year, 74 million euros, to set up a hardest fund uh, for us globally. So that, and that's meant that we've given out grants of well over 5 million Australian dollars to our team in Fiji, Hawaii, French Polynesia, New Zealand and Australia, who are in severe hardship. So that, that in itself just speaks to the hardest culture. Um, of who we are and what we're about. Um, so that was a real gift. But we had these people who were still connected to a core. Um, it wasn't just about giving them financial assistance and supporting them through that. It was, um, we ran a whole range of, you know, I'm sure many of you did the same thing, wellbeing programs. Um, the biggest thing was staying connected with people. You know, picking up the phone, calling people, having those virtual meetings. All of those different things were just so important um, over the last, you know, two years. And I think that will continue for us. But um, you know, the, the stress that our teams have been under, you know, the financial stress, the, the physical stress, and, you know, just to, you, then it, everything just pivoted all the time. So if I can just take the example of, I remember one weekend, um, we were debating whether we'd go into the quarantine business. You know, we're in the hospitality business. We don't lock people in rooms and don't speak to them and not clean their rooms. And so um, I was, we were debating it and our team should get higher rate. And it was just, some, but we made the decision to do it. We're the largest provider of quarantine. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, um, but the teams were terrified, scared going into that. So we had to sort of 
we sent our, um, our head of risk in and made, did a risk assessments and we ran lots of training for them and gave them the support that they need well beyond EAP. Many of them had individual coaching sessions, uh, our, not just the leaders in the business, but all even our frontline team members. We got a team of executive coaches that would go in to the quarantine hotels and work one-on-one -on -one with people. That was just one example. The flip to the other side of it, on the other end of quarantine, they've dealt with it, they've got secure income coming in for two years when the rest of industry industry's fallen apart, and now we've just taken it all away. So it's the reverse again. Um, and Hardest was really a big part of I mean, quarantine. There's so many examples I could give you, but the teams, they just run with it. So you create the idea and the philosophy and you kind of train them on it and you do that, but they just take it way beyond where I could ever imagine. And quarantine was a great example of that, where they, the way they cared for people, you know, who were having birthdays and missing <coughs> weddings and, you know, just struck, I mean, they did incredible things. They had opera concerts in the middle of the, you know, forecourt of the hotel that people could watch. Um, they would run, we, they, yeah, it was incredible. Like, I, I'm just so, so proud of the team and, and what they've done. And they just wrap their arms around each other. They run, I mean, they've been running hamper drives, dropping groceries at pe people's houses all over the Pacific region. That's how they genuinely came together as a team. So it's been really a terrible period of time for us as an industry, but I, it's given us a great deal of hope as well. And, you know, we now know after the last lockdown, that I truly believe recovery is, you know, was always going to be on the way. The world was not ending, and that is how it will be going forward. So that's been the last two years. Well, you've, oh, you've, 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 squeezed, <laughs> you've squeezed a lot in there. Yeah. Um, Sarah, when, when you think about some of the lessons you've learned as a leader through this period, particularly as it relates to well-being, you know, are there some major call-outs that you can sort of share with us there, please? Um, I, I'm actually a qualified executive coach as well. Um, and so for me, it's actually going back to, as a leader, really kind of entering the coaching space with people. Um, for me, that was a reminder of that, because sometimes you can just get on that treadmill and you keep going. But uh, coaching starts with the principle um, that the other person has the answer. And your job is to ask great questions and to listen. And so it was even more important to listen to people and really deeply listen and allow them the space to talk and, and those sort of things. So that for me was a really important reminder and a good lesson that I think we should all operate perhaps at a higher level um, with our conversations, our teams, our peers um, and operate in, in that sort of coaching mindset. So that was a really big one. The other one is just gratitude. You know, I just think, um, just being grateful for, you know, even in the darkest moments, the most difficult decisions, I could look at my team and just think they were just the greatest team and I was so proud of them and I could always find something and just be grateful. Um, and now we're starting to see people coming back into the business and yeah, it's, uh, it, that's the other thing too, is the gratitude. I think, and that, for me, when I think about, I used to talk about employee experience, I don't talk about that anymore, I talk about human experience. And that's what I've really learnt out of it, is that, you know, we need, there's financial elements that we need to be considerate of with our team, there's the psychological safety, there's the physical safety, there's all of those things. So, for me, it's not just employee experience anymore, I want to take it to a higher level. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, you spoke uh, about Hartist and having sort of science at its core, and I know, Simone, that you've spoken publicly about, you know, using data and perhaps insights even to tackle important issues like gender equality in the workplace sort of turning that data and insights lens onto the wellbeing frameworks that we're talking about now. Are there any sorts of, any thoughts that you could share with us about how data and insights can be used to leverage a better outcome for wellbeing and safety? Um, well, the number one learning for me was that as we entered COVID, um, and this is not a planted question, by the way, but the, the, <laughs> it showed to us that providers like the, our traditional EAP providers no longer cut the mustard because we actually more than ever needed the data and insights from those very partnerships and we weren't, weren't able to access them. So we were flying a little bit blind as were many organisations in the first sort of six months on what was actually the problem we're trying to solve here because there were so many goddamn problems. And as everyone's saying, you know, on a daily basis there's so much, you know, from a risk, from an operations, from a revenue, from a, you know, there's so much that we're all facing as we hit COVID. Um, and it was very evident to us, you know, um, near Matt, we're a very data-driven organisation, so I can't go into any executive meeting with what I used to do, which is a lot of book gut instinct, because let's face it, it's, you know, that's got a big role to play, but I'd always need to support it with, with data. Um, so that's actually one of the reasons we've been, um, you know, looking, 
and, and partnering with Sonder is because we need to build more data and insights, particularly around um, wellbeing. So currently what we had to do instead, and I've ended up having to sort of pull resources from various parts of the business to try and create dashboards um, to enable, you know, and I'm talking about dashboards that are being updated on a monthly basis so that we can really track, because I think um, one of the greatest challenges we've got at the moment um, is actually trying to work out what, what the biggest problem to solve is. Um, and again, you can get a lot of early indicators um, through some of the data and insights. We do a quarterly engagement survey, we track turnover data, you know, we're pulling all of that together. Um, but, you know, but having platforms that can actually, you know, I don't need to have teams developing the, the actual data, I can actually get the team analysing the data. Um, and early intervention. So I think there's a great opportunity. We collect data, as I said, it's very, very manual, um, and it's often looking backward. It's hard to then predict future. We're actually always looking at what, what the problem was sort of three months ago, six months ago, versus you know amber lights and what's coming up down the track. And I think in the current environment, what keeps me up at night is that um, you know the world has forever changed. The role of leader has changed, you know, and I don't think any of us know where the world of work, ways of working, what are the problems that we're going to be seeing in six to 12 months with dispersed, really dispersed workforces, with the angst over vaxxed and non-vaxxed, um, you know, with the feelings of safety, um, impact of people who are at home, relationship breakdowns because they're going to kill each other living at home, you know, work, all of these things to your point that the blur between home and work um, and society at the moment, you know, and again, I think a lot of us are flying a little bit blind. All of us in this room have the best intentions for our organisations. I think we all wanted to, but again, it's hard to know, you know, what is, what do we need to focus on? Um, and what, how will we know will we, you know, achieve what we need to achieve? Well, Simone, you're, you're a leader in a technology business, ASX 200 technology yeah. business, and and of course, data sits at the core of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, so it's not surprising, therefore, that you sort of look at the problem set that we're all here to discuss and yeah. look at it from a data-led point of view. One of the things that we're, um, we're trying to move toward, I think, is the lead indicators. What, if, what are the things that are going to suggest an outcome so you can take those early intervention sort of pathways? Historically, it's like stated preference and revealed preference data. Yeah. How do you sort of tie a thread between those two things in the context of your technology experience? Um, well, I think again, it's been really, again, because data, there's almost too much of it. So we're at the moment really, like a lot of companies, the great resignation, it's coming. Um, we're, um, as I said, half our workforce is in the US. We've seen it there. Australia, in terms of everything in COVID and everything, we're six months behind the rest of the world. And so we're sort of looking to see. Um, so we've started, um, you know, really looking at what's happening in the US and then um, driving our indicators here. So, for example, we're, we're um, really delving into LinkedIn data at the moment to supplement or our others, because I need to know who in my organisation has suddenly become more active on LinkedIn. Um, seriously, um, more active on LinkedIn, because you can, if you've got the right access, you can work out who's... <laughs> who's Are we recording this? <laughs> but it's true, you just need to pay enough money to LinkedIn so we can actually see who, who's uploading profiles, who, you know, we can... Pull. So we're starting to marry to get, um, you know, to, we are looking back, but we also go, okay, on those key areas, particularly around turnover, um, the, ch the biggest challenge we've got a lot of, there's a lot of concern over mental health and burnout in our organisation. Um, and we don't have lead indicators on that at the moment, but we do have a lots of lead, you know, because we are trying to, to your point, marry together, um, but we're actually focusing more on turnover because at the moment in terms of how can we get some lead indicators to help inform our um, decisions on top talent at the moment. Indeed. Thanks, Simone. So about 18 months ago, um, this business, Sonda, fell on pretty tough times. We had uh, about 90% of our market was with the universities, and of course we all know how that 
that ended very quickly. Um, one of the first phone calls I had uh, in, in the aftermath of that was with Brad Banducci, the CEO of Woolworths, um, and then very quickly landed in a room with Brian Long. Now, Brian is the general manager of safety, health, and well-being of Woolworths Group, so it's looking after about 1% of the Australian population, about 250,000 people, so a mighty, mighty task. I think when you and I met, mate, it was about two weeks into the, into the job, um, and so induction of fire, perhaps, but, but if we, it's, it's, I think, from the comfort of sitting here now, and is, is that little uh, Italian cola we're having? Like, it's all, all pretty pretty amazing now. But if we sort of cast our mind back to 18 months ago, with very different times, there was no chance there was Italian cola on the shelves because there was supply chain that was massively um, undercooked um, across across the world. Of course, we had um, people being stabbed in in stores um, to get extra rolls of toilet paper, although I don't think that was a common out uh, occurrence, it did, did happen. There was huge levels of um, staff abuse for frontline customers, uh, frontline workers, and of course Woolworths is at the coalface of much of this, Brian. Um, hugely, you know, I think naively I looked at Woolworths as the storefront at least initially, and then of course, as soon as you put your mind to it and you understand the, the huge machinery that operates that business from supply chain logistics and the corporate, and I mean, it's just a hugely complex beast. Brian, you've got a diverse workforce, perhaps the most diverse workforce. It exists in all far corners of the country, and in fact, in nine countries around the world. How do you deal with the complexities that you have in your workforce, the, the niche requirements that exist across, and how do you tie that all together to, to generate the outstanding you know, products that you do at Woolworths? Thanks for the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's probably the question we ask ourselves continually. It's how do we do justice to uh, the scale of the challenge versus the purpose and aspiration that the organisation has and we try and indeed the board have put out there many times. And I think it not to oversimplify this, but fundamentally our North Star is very much about being purpose-led and about focusing on core values. Um, and this happened before my time, but it's, it's a fantastic set of core values because they are amazingly simplistic, but fundamentally impactful and meaningful for so many people. So, when you are faced with some of the complexities that you've highlighted and you look at some of the challenges that we've all had to lean into over the last few years, when you start the day and you ask yourself three simple questions, which is, how can I care deeply? How can I listen and learn? How can I do the right thing? And you superimpose that in your leadership decision-making process. That will pretty much guide you to kind of navigate your way through a lot of the complexity. And so I think a lot of the times, yes, there are frameworks, yes, there are procedures, yes, there are things that people can leverage. But when you deep down get to the sort of human spirit, and human connection, and you frame up some of these challenges through some of these very, very simple, yet usually impactful kind of statements of intent, um, it serves you well. And so my reflection would be, um, Brad really instilled that in the leadership team and many, many teams across the business. Uh, and when it was probably challenging, where there would have been a commercial imperative to manage something, but then there was also the purpose piece on the other side of the fence, almost every time we went to purpose, and we asked those three simple questions. You know, if we were doing the right thing by our people, what we're carrying feel like, what would listening and learning need to look like, and what would doing the right thing need to feel like for team and for customers. And so I think the biggest uh, achievement through COVID for Woolworths has been, yes, we've gotten you know the food to people's homes, yes, we've ensured that the customer experience has been upheld, but I think fundamentally we've stayed through to that purpose and to the core values, and I think it's stand, it's stood the organization in great stead for, for the future. So that would be my kind of response really. It's, it's related with purpose and core values. 
and Brian, I'm conscious not to make this about you, um, but you're studying a, a PhD at the moment, sort of in a related field. Would you just because I was not busy enough? <laughs> <laughs> would Would you care to tell us just a little bit about that and, and your hypothesis yeah. as it relates to to, to this sure. discussion? Look, okay, it's it's um, a few people have touched on it this morning, so this afternoon, I should say. Um, look. I think fundamentally because the world is changing and has changed probably forever, there is a series of institutional forces that are playing up, both in terms of the social ones but also sort of the industrial and commercial ones that fundamentally is affecting everybody. So I guess my hypothesis is that um, to be able to build resilient capacities in the organisations that we all work within, we have to know be always on and always attuned to what's happening around us and the external things that happen will just continue to influence people and arguably because of social media and all the connections that people are building we can't kind of live in a bunker anymore we just the world affects us and it's affecting us by the second and so if an organization isn't constantly uh, i guess looking and perceiving what those things are and those things can impact the people then fundamentally they run the risk of you know, not being able to dynamically respond and continue with those um, sort of adaptive capacities that people need to be able to deal with all these difficulties. So, um, yeah, that's the theory. Um, I'm very early, very early on in the uh, exploratory piece, but um, yeah, I, I do think the future of organizational sort of um, structure is about how do you build resilient capacities, which are dynamic enough such that if it's not COVID, it will be climate change. If it's yeah. not climate change, it'll be a change in government or it'll be a major or socio-economic shift or a global China will do something, yeah. whatever the case may be. And so if organizations aren't attuned to that and dynamic enough to move with that, then I think it's the people that are gonna get the impact, which is completely the wrong thing, but that's what will happen. People will be affected by those macro themes. So being, I guess, attuned to that is gonna be critical. Thanks, Brian. And we're talking about affecting people. And Alexia, you uh, you lead at, at Clayton Woods, which I think I described from courtesy of uh, Craig as a bastion of high performance. <laughs> I'm stealing that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but on a serious note, I mean, it, you've got a lot of young people um, that are probably really um, huge thirst for expertise, from knowledge, from mentorship, from the partners. And if you think about it, a law firm just as a subset of broader professional services, this is a pretty significant challenge, particularly when you've got huge, you know, for the last two years at least, we have people working from home, probably not getting you know, that, that professional experience that we might otherwise um, hope for. How are you seeing that affect your team um, and, of course, the experience that you're getting as a result of this? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, before COVID, we would have said that we had a, an incredibly flexible workforce. We had 65, our former flex managers sitting in the, in the audience. Oh, um, <laughs> we, we, we would have said that we had 65% of people who had flexible working arrangements. Um, and and that, that meant that we were really well placed for COVID. But having a percentage or a very large percentage of people that can work flexibly is very different to suddenly having 100% of people having to work uh, from home and that brings with it different challenges um, and, and I think one of the things that we've really realised is that the, the experience that you have working from home or working flexibly very significantly if you're the person in a share house in Surrey Hills um, where there's three of you working around a kitchen table to perhaps if you've um, debunked to your beach house in the northern beaches where you've got uh, you know so, so the experience of people during COVID is very different. Um, imagine you're, you're a new grad starting at the firm, I think a, a week into COVID we had 90 new grads start. Uh, instead of having this wonderful experience that they would usually have where you know, they all come to Sydney to do orientation, they meet everybody, they're doing fun things and going on boats and cocktail parties and, and meeting everybody. Um, the other bit's more important than meeting everybody and, and the work induction. Is this what lawyers do? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense, yeah. Of course, no. Um, at, you know, to all of a sudden, they were doing a, an induction, five days sitting at home, you know, watching it on, on a screen. Um, that's, diff that's different. Um, that connection 
that you have as an employee. You know, we talk about Clayton Eads is having pride in the brand. We're proud to work at the firm. There's that connection to, to the firm, the connection to your team, uh, and, and the connection to, to the client. So, you know, those young graduates have had a, a very different experience. Uh, where a people business, you learn from those around you, observing the, the partner on the phone, listening to what they've done. Um, and, and some of that is, is really been um, difficult for those people coming through. So we've really had to focus on what we can do to make sure people still have that connection. Um, and it was really, uh, we've just finished a, a large engagement survey. And one of the things that, well, three things that I took out of it, which were really positive for us, was firstly um, the, the number of people who said they feel, felt, still felt connected to the firm during the last two years, and that was really high. There was a real sense of connection. I'm going to say in my team, it was 100%. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, and then the other two that were really important to us is that people felt that through this period that their, their partners and leaders cared about their mental health and wellbeing. That was very high. And the other one, which I thought was amazing, was uh, that their colleagues and co-workers cared. Um, and so that work, the work that we've done in, in trying to keep that team connection, that uh, really concentrating on supportive leadership and leaders listening and caring to what, what, what happened, um, uh, that's what I credit with where we are. And Alexia, Simone touched on the great resignation, which we've seen yeah. sort of coming out in the, in the newspapers of late. And of course, um, more broadly, it's sort of called the war for talent. So if you think about some of the newer staff that are having their sort of formative experiences, of, do you think you're building, not just you, but in professional services writ large, is it possible to build that and inculcate that sense of culture and belonging within an organisation? Or do you think the working from home means that's a little bit more tenuous and we're going to see a little bit more movement between, between professional services firms? I think you can create it, but I think it's more difficult to do so. Um, it, it's, you've got to work harder. You've got to um, be more conscious of those inclusive meetings, particularly when you've got hybrid meetings. I mean, one of the wonderful things here today is that we're all in the room together. It, it's always difficult when you're doing these things and you've got half virtual and, and half in the room and you get a very different experience. Uh, I think you need to have a stronger sense of a brand and values to get that sense of connection so that if, if that's very strong, I, I think it can be done. Um, it is, um, there is certainly a, a war for talent, um, and if you know any lawyers, there's some great jobs going up late years. <laughs> steady, steady, steady. <laughs> um, there's certainly, we're, we're seeing that from people moving, but also, um, you know, we've had, uh, we would usually bring a lot of talent in from overseas, which, which hasn't happened. Um, we, we see that our young lawyers care uh, not just about, um, it, it's not about salary, it's about the quality of the work, it's about the team that they're working for, it's that connection. And so you've got to deliver on those promises. Um, we've just had a heap of summer clerks start and I uh, presented to them earlier in the week, or well, last week about risk management. I ran into one of our summer clerks afterwards and it was, it was really lovely. It was like, oh, you gave that presentation, that was really great. And I asked him how he'd found his first day properly working as a summer clerk, and he was like, oh my God, it's exceeded all of my expectations. It's better than the marketing. <laughs> um, and, and I thought that was just really So I'm just picturing amazing. suits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, They're yeah. better dressed. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, it'd be remiss to not, um, not to open up to, to, the, to the room here and, uh, and, and get to any, what, any of your own thoughts or insights, so please be open to sharing some of those but please we'd love to make the panel available for any of your your questions so love to have a love to have a starter um, sorry. and may I ask to just introduce yourself Mark Ray, Margie, Staffing. Um, and I'm kind of interested what, what you've all done is great uh, and what we've done is great frankly but no one cares what are you doing for me today uh, Spoken about great resignation. Uh, and reading about this in the presence of the morning. But can you define that to what do you think that means and how you're thinking about that for next year? The great resignation means. Well, we've actually recoined it and no one's allowed to use this. We're actually about to start marketing it as a new maps idea. We're actually calling it the great opportunity. 
because I actually think that um, if organisations are listening to their people and pivoting and being flexible and sort of looking out of where the world's going, this is actually a great opportunity, um, and particularly around flexibility, um, you know, and sort of listening to your workforce and going, okay, what makes sense here? Because we've actually gone out there, uh, we've waited, we're not, we don't need to set the pace here. I think a lot of organisations want to be the first to go out and sort of put positions out. We don't need to be on anything. We're sort of going, when we've got things that are known, let's give certainty, but also we don't know all the answers because everything's changing so much. But we have gone out now and said, if you don't ever want to come back into the office, um, you don't need to come back into the office. But we're going to put all our energy into giving great reasons to bring you into the office. Um, but we're, we, we've gone out there and said, you know, we're not. So we're trying to give certainty, but we're also going, we know the world has changed and every bit of data uh, survey we do, most people do not want to come back in full time and they don't want to be told, well, you can come in two days a week, but it's Wednesday and Thursday because that's when I'm in and I'm your manager, and, you know. Yeah. So, um, so for us, um, you know, we're going to call it a great opportunity. We think it means that we can start tapping on um, in the war for talent. We can start actually attracting people, but then we've got to be very clear on what do we think, you know, what's going to differentiate us in the market, what do people care about, and actually make sure that we're going out there and, and really selling our brand. Yeah, them. maybe if I could add something sure. to... Well, I'm, I'm really interested from the affordable voice point of view. Yeah. It's a little easier for professionals, but um, yeah. I'm just yeah. closely the system. Yep. Um, We're, we have historically, you know, hospitality, travel and tourism has historically been a very <coughs> traditional business, very hierarchical, you know, there's a general manager and then there's this, and you've got your chief concierge, they wear the gold key, like, you know, it's very hierarchical, very traditional business. So we actually didn't have, you know, 65% of our workforce all set up for flexible working. That I remember the day when I first started, I got one remote working person working, looking after our Victorian region. Um, based out of Sydney, I jumped up and down in my kitchen on a Sunday afternoon be, just getting that over the line. So that's how far behind we were, and I, that's not just us, I would say, shall we, same industry, um, you know, um, <laughs> that's everyone. So we, we, this basically meant we leapt forward, you know, some organisations saying 10 years, I'd say our industry 20, 25 years minimum, we've leapt forward in how we thought. So we literally, same thing. We have a lot of professionals as well um, in our organisation. We've got lawyers, we've got architects, we've got designers, you know, marketing, all those sort of things. But fundamentally, out of those 21,000 people, um, frontline workers, the concierge, your room attendants, things like that. So um, we came up with a philosophy um, similar to sort of what you're talking about. And our philosophy was, and we coined it, work your way. Mm. And as soon as um, there was an opportunity to come back to the office last year in the hotels, we just said, there's no rules. We are not going to say you have to be there on these days. And if you prefer to work, you know, housekeeping is a great example, right? We've traditionally, everyone started at 7 a.m. in the morning, finished at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then the 3 o'clock shift would come in and work to 11. Well, that's gone. You know, if you prefer to come in at 10 and work to 5, that's also okay by us. So work your way is different things for different people. So in the hotel environment, or we operate the corner lounges, our job is to know your story. What's your story? What does it mean to you? Um, you know, is it that you have an elderly parent that you care for? Is it that you like surfing and that's why we've got a big office on the Gold Coast and you want to go and surf in the morning and then come and work late in the evening? Well, that's actually the beauty of hospitality. So for us, I'm really excited about it. We, we didn't apply rules. It took a lot to get it over the line. Our CEO, he just wanted everyone to get back together and see everyone. And so we did a lot of surveying, collected the data, you know, data, insight, action. And as soon as I could show through that surveying of our teams that they did not, um, you know, want to operate in the way we always had, then, um, and one of the big comments he now quotes all the time is, you know, you treated us like adults, don't stop doing that now. And so it's all about trust um, around what we do. So I think we have, we've just pivoted to, I think this, you know, come and work in our industry because it's so amazing. You can be a law student and come and work with us. You can be someone who's more mature and you want to travel around, you know, um, the world and you can come and work with us and do all sorts of things. So. It's what I call meeting people where they're at, is, is the philosophy. And, you know, at the end of the day, if your organisation has a deep purpose, that's what people want. The reason people are leaving organisations is because they don't feel connected, they don't feel deep sense of purpose, and at the end of the day, they don't want opportunity. I, I accept that I've not been with a core my whole career. I think that makes you a better executive. So I think let people go, allow them to come back. You know, those are the sort of things we've got to embrace. So that's what we've been doing.
Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of almost, I'm probably not the best person to answer the question, but I'll give it a go. I mean, I think the, the three things that come to mind would be, one, um, we've absolutely responded to what COVID has generated in the normal <coughs> flexibility, the need for more flexibility, um, you know, policy shifts and a series of things that have been introduced to enable that. There are, of course, challenges in a frontline context where you simply can't do that because people physically have to be there. Which then takes us, I guess, to the other two parts of this, which would be, I think, and arguably for me are the more important bits. One would be, I think what COVID has done is it's actually uncovered deep-seated things that were always there, but it's shone a bigger light on it. And so when I think about that, I specifically think about the work environment, and then I actually think about work itself and the construct of work. And so from a work environment perspective, it's clearly shown that people want a more collaborative space, the opportunity to engage and be collaborative. So we're actually re-examining the whole notion of you know, the office and shared spaces and desks and what it needs to look like, because that's what people are telling us. This is cool. Yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> correct, yeah. And I think the third, the third one, which is without question the hardest one to fix, and that is, what is it about work and the work culture and the work environment that I'm involved in that COVID has shown a light on? Well, it's probably just made you question whether, actually, you know what, I'm kind of being bullied here. I've never really thought about it, but now that I'm at home and I'm like being with my family, I'm not sure I'm going to put up with that anymore. Or, you know what? 22 hour days, really? Like, do I really have to do that? So I think what it's doing is it's giving people the opportunity to reflect on what truly matters in their life, and as a consequence, look at work and what is work in my life. And if work is being sort of a heat lost and making it difficult for people, then you know it's going to make people kind of walk with their feet. So what you can't do is have this massive, brilliant purpose and all these great values and tell people you care and you love them and this and and their felt experiences. Why out of it? I just spent 22 hours, you know, mm -hmm. working. I'm dead. Yeah. I've done that for six days solid. Well, of course they're going to resign. But they are. Like, so would I. So I think the, the challenge or the opportunity with this is to take the data that's coming back in these surveys and sort of say, use the great resignation as it's the great. It is an opportunity to Simone's point to go. What is it about us that we can do to make this better? Uh, and while law firm, we obviously have a, a lot of lawyers. One of the the greatest things that I saw out of COVID, we also employ a lot of, uh, you know, wait staff, people who work in our office services team, our facilities team and the like. And, and one of the things that we said at the very beginning of COVID is that, you know, we, we needed to, while, while we had to shut our offices, we needed to keep all of these people employed and in, in jobs and create that loyalty. We had to live, you know, we say we care, well, how are we going to demonstrate that? And, and one of the very practical things that we did is we set up, um, we sort of became Clayton Newt's Uber Eats. It was see you food for you. So all of those people that had been employed as our, as our wait staff, uh, we started a, a food delivery service. So as an employee, you could um, order food that Clayton Newt's people would be in there cooking in the kitchens. And, and um, so it supported people working from home because they didn't have to grocery shop and they didn't have to cook for their for their kids, but it, it kept meant that we kept this whole workforce uh, employed and engaged, and and, and hopefully, um, you know, we've shown some value and, and loyalty, and, and hopefully, you get the same in, in return. I think actually that's important. A lot of the intel out of Europe, it's people are looking and going, how was I treated? You know, what did I say? And not just how was I treated, but how was my peers treated? You know, what did I see? Because to your point. Culture is what you do, not what you say. So, you know, people are going, okay, I, I respect this company, I'm going to stay put. Thank you. <clears throat> and great question, promoted great discussion. Anyone else like to make a, make a point, offer an insight, or direct a question? I have a question. We'll, we'll, we'll hold, hold from you just for a sec second one. Please. Um, well, he's our CFO, so it's probably going to be, <laughs> probably going to be some sort of, I don't know, money related. Um, Chanel from Ramsey, welcome um, here. We've got 33,000 people on the I just wondered, I've, um, I'm CRAD, so one of the things that I think is a risk we're sort of grappling with is what I'm calling workplace creep, where you've gone from working, even if you did a 14 hour day, you only did eight hours of work. Now everyone's doing 14 hours of work. And you know, we've had it for 18 months.
months, and everyone's very used to it, and it's become, you know, I think there's a lot of anxiety around that being the new normal, and now I can't leave my computer to go to the toilet for two minutes because I come back and I've missed, you know, 15 emails. So I just wanted to give you quite a complex group. How are you thinking about that, and is it an issue for you? Yeah, I might start that off just, um, I'm, the funny, the thing that I find now, I'm sure you find the same, you're in your virtual meeting and if you have one minute past the <laughs> minute that you are late, like, and I, I, I always get on the meeting, like, let's be honest, we all turned up today for a meeting and it's okay if everyone's, you know, coming in and settling and I think we have to keep reminding ourselves of those things, that's one thing we do in the organisation is make sure that we kind of talk about those things and have those rules. Interestingly, um, our head office is in Paris. So a lot of our executives, and not even our executives, our leaders are on calls very late at night um, and things like that. So it is actually quite real for us. So we've taken a responsibility to actually track that. So um, we track um, the additional hours that people are, are working and we make sure, and there's a requirement that they take time off the next day or within at least 72 hours and things like that. So um, we have to be really serious about that. So last night I was on a call at 11 o'clock um, you know, those sorts of things. And I'm not the only one in the organisation where that's happening. Um, so for us, it's, it's taking responsibility for it. And it's having really genuine conversations, reminding people that this virtual world, what was it like when we used to get together and we go to work? Um, and just things like the whole work your way philosophy, like we, we say to our teams, we want to hear stories of what you're doing. So if you want to you know, take a couple of hours in the morning and walk your dog or whatever it is, tell us about that and we talk about those things a lot. Our um, CEO, um, he, when I first started, said he'd never work from home. He just couldn't do it. I can almost not get him out. He's, of... he's got seven children though. Yes, he, he does. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> There's a reason for There's everything. Nine. <laughs> but, yeah, so, but, he, but he set himself up elsewhere. So, and funnily enough, our legal team who sit next to me, they were like really against anyone in the legal department working from home historically. Now they're the ones I'm never getting back. <laughs> So we, you've got to keep your sense of humour as well, but I, I do think we've got to take responsibility. We track it and we check in on people and we do things like that. So um, that's just some insights from us. Um, as a fellow risk person, absolutely, that's <laughs> something that's front of mind for us. I think there's certainly been, uh, you know, what we're hearing from people is, um, I can't get that break between my personal life and my work life. It's, I don't know when it ends. I, I get up in the morning and I, I start working um, and, and there aren't those natural breaks. So we spend a lot of time talking to people about how to get those breaks in their day um, and, and what are some of those practical things that they could do. And also uh, very much encouraging that there is an end to the day. What that might look like is is up to you. Um, we sort of say it's a better day your way. Uh, and so if you work better in the morning or whatever it might be, well, well that's fine. Um, some people do enjoy, you know, they might want to have a break in the middle to go pick up kids, uh, all of those things. It's about, you know, setting that up and giving you the control to do it the way you want. Um, and. We also, I mean, there is part of it, it, it's got to work for you and it's got to work for your team and it's got to work for the client. So it's about, as you say, having those discussions so that everybody understands that. Um, we do monitor very closely the working hours that people are doing, particularly uh, junior lawyers uh, and graduates. We have to do that. Those strong believer that the habits that you start as a, a graduate are, are the ones that you will continue. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of emphasis that's put on there. Um, it, it's it's also you know there's the personal well-being aspect of that, but there's also a, a, a general risk and quality of work thing that that comes out as well, um, and so we're we're very conscious of uh, and really need to put in very direct specific strategies to help people with that. Yeah, look to be honest, we pivoted probably in about April this year all our focus and investment on development move to um, how to support leaders to, to manage burnout um, and also it's really it's different when you're you know going into the office most days and you're interacting and you're eyeballing someone you can generally pick up cues on when something's not right it's very very difficult when you're having online interactions with people that you know and leaders weren't equipped with it and also we used to do a lot of coaching and you know we have had an EAP in place that you know, provide support for people dealing with stress and anxiety. But I think through COVID, the role of leader in that has become even more important. And it's not a natural thing for most leaders, particularly in tech. 
lot of our yeah, it's the most uncomfortable thing for them. So we actually ended up partnering with, um, and I'll be very honest that we almost we we had a hard lesson because again the US is six months ahead of us. So the US have been in lockdown. We've got um, one of our head offices in Salt Lake City. It's fucking freezing there during the six months. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Snow. We had one of our executives. And, and it's a, it was a real watch out. He was in a, but we call it the bunker because he was in, he used to have his office in his cellar. He didn't see the sun for about six months. He subsequently left the organisation because he just he broke. You know, he was working from the US to here. He was doing 15 hour days. We've got, you know, we're, we're all very aggressive targets to it, you know, and we, you just had to get on with it. We're all very stoic, you dig deep. But he literally, burnt out and, and um, subsequently left the, left the organisation and he wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, so as a, as a consequence of that we've, we've invested, we had 10 modules, we'd partnered with an external psychologist, Mark Butler, he ran programs across for every employee, five sessions on how to manage and pick yourself up through burnout and your family and, and then also leaders on how to. Um, we then I myself, burn, I kid you not, burn out on a Wednesday. I just went, if I have to deal with one more uh, male or male executive, if I have to deal with one more middle aged man this week, <laughs> I'm going to throw myself off my balcony. <laughs> and so I literally called my CEO in the morning and said, I'm going to end up doing something, I'm going to scream at someone. I, you know, I, I can't go on. And I'm not coming in for the next three days because I'm honestly broken. And I then did a vlog. The next week, once I'd regained my sanity, to the whole company going, Oh my god, I've just literally broken. If I'm feeling like that and I'm in a position where I can talk, speak up, because I'm that's the type of person I am, but not everyone can do that. But if I'm feeling it, I guarantee there's 20, 30, 40 percent of you are feeling that. Um, and that triggered, honestly, a lot of internal because everyone's like, Thank God, if you feel okay saying it, I can. We implemented through for the next four months a U day every month, where that was a day where every individual could just go, I'm not coming in today, and it's no annual leave, no, you know, um, and, and really started targeting and actually started doing a bit of analytics around um, how, how long people are online in Zoom, how long to start going, where are the hot spots through the organisation where this is not normal? And actually having direct conversations to go, you are not coming in tomorrow, you're just gonna go for a walk have some fresh air, you know, um, because burnout is a huge issue at the moment across all organisations. Brian, this speaks to your PhD. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, you know, clinical burnout, I think, is the new frontier. Yep. Um, and the specificity of language will be critical because lots of people talk about mental health or well-being, but we've got to get a bit more granular on what are some of the impacts and you know, one of these major impacts particularly in an executive cohort because of this kind of perceived notion of you know, bulletproof and I can mm -hmm. think Berlin's going to become a massive challenge, not just in Australia, but yeah. globally. So understanding what you can do then in the context of some of those structural things, which a lot of people have spoken about. And to your question, I think that's that's going to be the, the unlock. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've got to get people thinking well-being in that context. Yeah. and not less, but as well as thinking about it in the context of response, care, etc. So a lot of it's about actually structural, yeah. completely re-evaluating the way we imagine work, because it's work is what's creating the issue. And it's a perfect storm, but it's work plus a pandemic, and then you get... Plus the work, so. talent shortage. <laughs> yeah, so, so all of these yeah. things combined will, will be driving these outcomes. So Ryan, I, I said he's a CFO, but he's not just a CFO. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, um, on, on, a, on, a, on a real note, Ryan is a he's, he's got an exceptional product mind. And amongst his achievements, separate to the, the finance world, is sort of leading the development of the, the app, the AFL app with Telstra alongside Telstra, um, and you know was part of the founding team of the Giants, uh, the AFL team, who was second only to the Sydney Swans, of course. But, but Ryan, why don't, you, why don't you take us away for the, the final one, mate? Uh, some of you, got, Brian, you touched on some of the other answers have, but really, how does your view of the, where your work life ends and your personal life starts change dramatically as a result of COVID and what 
what is that line that you guys see as executive leaders in your business for how you look after your people? Because as I said, we, we do get different answers geographically based on where our teams are, um, internationally, locally, what they do. But how has your own views changed on that, if, if they have it all? And, and what do you see as the, the future of that over the next six months? Uh, on a on a personal level, um, I had before I had this job with the core, I had my own business for ten years, and um, I had a team that was all remote. They were um, often young um, or women returning to the workforce and wanted flexibility, and you know wasn't offered. So I'd been operating that way for ten years. When I came back into a you know the typical corporate role, it was back into you know more normal hours and meetings and things like that. So. For me, it was interesting. My husband said to me at the time, gosh, you just slipped right back into that when I got to the corporate piece of long hours and meetings and planes and everything else. Um, but equally the same happened for me when COVID happened. I was able to easily slip back into that way of operating. Um, you know, this is a revolution that we're in around work and the way the world works. So yes, it has, and I'm um, more, um, I think we have more of a responsibility to talk about it, I think to Simone's point, you know, this idea of hero leadership, that's, that's gone. You just have to, we're, we're all people, we're all humans, and we've got to share and learn, and that's actually the, the new frontier of leadership is, is doing those sorts of things. So I really applaud you for doing that um, as well, you know, with the organisation, that's wonderful. So it has, and um, yeah, I, on a personal level, I love uh, the flexibility I have, the ability to locate myself anywhere and work and keep doing that. And I just want people to, <coughs> set their own rules around how they want to work and live. And my job is to enable that in our organisation and find a way to make that work. I, I, in our industry, people have often served us. That's been the history of our industry. And I truly believe that it is now our responsibility to serve others, our employees. And, and that's what has shifted. I'm, I'm really deeply committed to that and that is what I'm, I'm really wanting to do every day. And I'm, there's a lot of traditional, a lot of, you know, gentlemen who've been working in the industry a long time. It is a battle, but it's something I'm really committed to. So on a personal level, I love it. Um, and um, I want to make sure everyone in the organisation has that opportunity, no matter what your job is, whether you're a chef, whether you're an architect, whatever your role is. And so, um, guys, we want to leave just a few minutes for us to, to mingle and enjoy each other's company. So would you, would you join me in thanking this terrific panel? We really appreciate your insights, guys. I think the, the operative things that came out for me at the most fundamental level was just authentic leadership. And I think so much of what was said today in varying forms, whether it was about values or, or hardest and the philosophy of how do we put our people first, but it ultimately comes down, I think, very simply and, uh, to authentic leadership. Um, and, and Brian, you spoke really clearly of, of values and, and using that to help us navigate through a really complex environment that we're all living in. And, and if we can use values and, and really subscribe to them, not just at a masthead level where we put them on the website and, and, and there it shall remain, but we have to inculcate this and, and really um, use it as a way that we drive action. Um, but um, please join with me in thanking this wonderful group. And, uh, and to a final vote of thanks, um, this the period that we've uh, enjoyed over the past sort of two years or thereabouts um, has been largely, you know, the, the people on the front face of this is, have been the frontline workers in varying sort of realms, whether that's in, in the medical field or it's in the professional services um, f uh, fields or, or, or frontline at or Woolworths, um, getting, getting us fed and making sure the trolleys are full. Um, we're represented today in, in Sonda by a, a terrific team of nurses and psychologists and doctors that are sitting just a couple of panes of glass away. Um, so please join with me as representative of the first line workers in, in, thanking, in thanking those people. Well, thanks so much, and we uh, please enjoy the enjoy the food, enjoy each other's company, and thanks again to to you guys. Bye bye. Thank you.